And uh, I guarantee you, you know, this whole crazy world that we're in right now and what's coming in the future, uh, you know, if it could be crazier, it will be. And uh, we're gonna have to be prepared and our children are gonna to have to be prepared. They're, they're the ones that'll be growing up in a lot of the issues that are now roaming around and battling around over this whole world, not just our country, but this whole crazy world we're living in. Uh, things are, things are a-shaking, so to speak, and uh, I know you sense that in your spirit. You have to. If you're a child of God, you sense in your spirit that things are, um, it's critical, it's crucial. And the Lord's got a word for us. He's going to teach us how to, how to live in this world for as long as we need to before he comes to get us, which he says he is going to do. That one of these days in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be called heavenward to be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, it says. So until that time, we live in a crazy world. And a world that is, uh, well, I mean, I'm 62 years old, and I've never seen things as bad as they are. And I know you, uh, those of you probably saying some of the same things, you know, yeah, good yeah, night, yeah. man, what is wrong with this yeah, crazy yeah. thing? And whether it's our country, whether it's the, the issues of the flag and, the, and an anthem and a respect and all of that, or whether it's foreign stuff going on or terrorism everywhere. And I mean, the Bible talks all about this. This is not a surprise to God. Let me just say that to you. And, um, and when I was preaching things about end times back in the 70s and, and 80s, it was really difficult to, to, to envision how those things would ever happen. It was, it, we were, I was preaching them and we, I was saying, here's what's going to happen according to the Bible. And I would begin describing some things. And, and I, I know the people sitting out there were like me. How would this ever happen? You know, how could this, how could, could this happen like this? Yeah. But we don't ask that anymore because we're now seeing it every day in front of our eyes. And we're seeing the unfolding of those events that'll be coming. In January, I'm gonna start on the book of Revelation, uh, uh, if I'm finished with Jane by then. <laughs> I should be, uh, but I didn't wanna go through the Christmas season and all of that uh, uh, with the book of Revelation. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not you know intended to be frightening and all of that. It is quite dramatic. It does have a lot of drama in it. And... Um, the book is about Jesus. If you're wondering, if you say, man, what, the book of Revelation, you, many of you probably have never even heard verses read out of the book of Revelation. It, it's one of the most neglected books that I, in the Bible. I'll guarantee you there are fewer people that read the book of Revelation than any other book in the Bible, and there's certainly fewer sermons out of it than any book in the Bible. Uh, but it's the only book, just to give one little word about it, it is the only book that right at the beginning of the book, and right at the end of the book, it tells you that you will be blessed if you read this book and you understand the words of its prophecy. In other words, it's the only book in the Bible that says, if you read me, you're going to be blessed. God's going to bless you if you read this book. And I'm certain that probably goes into a lot of Satan's strategy to keep us out of that book. Um, but uh, we're going to dive in, and uh, yeah, we'll dive in and, and see what the Lord has to say to us, because I really feel in my heart that, uh, that it, these days demand for us to be prepared for whatever may be, yeah. and so anyway, I want to try to help us be prepared and help you be prepared. I'm not trying to teach the world, but I, I, I do feel responsibility for this flock that the Lord's given me. I'm yeah, the shepherd, yeah. and God holds me accountable and responsible, and I take that very seriously. And, and, and so I, I want you to know, and I want us to be prepared uh, for what God's doing. And along with that comes the book of James. Uh, the book of James, I've pre this is the third message, I believe, that we've, that we've been on out of the book of James. And of course, I've titled the series Walk the Talk because that's what really the whole book is about. It's about um, uh, don't talk about how great your faith is. Show me how great your faith is. I mean, by the way you live and by the way you uh, 
act in your life, show me what God has done in your life. Because faith without works is dead. It doesn't say faith is dead. It says if your faith is strong enough to save you, is strong enough to affect the way you live your life. That's what basically James is saying. And uh, so the book is about the common issues of life that all of us face, and it begins the whole first chapter of the book, if you've read it. How many of you have read the whole first chapter of James? Let me see you. Oh, good. Well, several of you. Um, if you've read the whole first chapter, then you're familiar with the fact that everything in the first chapter is about suffering. The whole first chapter is about why do Christians suffer? Why does God allow that to happen? What does God do in the midst of our suffering? What our suffering is supposed to accomplish? Uh, every thought or issue of suffering as a child of God seems to be uh, run through in this first chapter of the book of James. So I know that, you know, the first two or three messages that I've preached and this today and then next week, you know, you may be getting tired of all this suffering talk, you know, but, uh, but it's intended to be a blessing and to help you grasp. Is there anybody in this building who has not suffered anything in their life? Okay, so I'm talking to the right crowd then. We've all suffered, right? All right, so... We, we've all experienced what James is going to be talking about throughout this chapter. And, and wouldn't you like to know what that's all about? And, you know, I know many people that teach nowadays even. You can turn, it on, turn TV on and see the happiness boys up on the screen. And, and, and they'll be talking about prosperity. And they'll be talking about uh, uh, healing and health and riches and... Uh, blessings and all kinds of issues like that, but you don't see anything about suffering in there at all. It's almost as if the theology is that if you're a child of God, you, you don't suffer. Mm -hmm. If you become a Christian, then God's going to protect you and bless you, and you're not ever going to have to go through things that are hurtful or harmful or questionable or unpleasant in life. Well, many of our tests, many of our trials are very unpleasant, Right? They're not happy. They're, they're, they're tough on us. And so what, what, what is God doing? What, what's this all about? I mean, does, that, does, it, does it compute that as a child of God, I'm going to have to go through things that other people have to go through that aren't a child of God? My next door neighbor who never darkens the door of a church, it doesn't seem like they have a lot of stuff they go through. But here I am, a Christian, trying to live for Jesus, and it seems like every other day I'm hit with something that just rattles my cage. I have to live through or go through or, you know, march on or have faith. And, you know, your, your Christian friends talk to you and say, hey, brother, just hang on and it's going to be good and God's going to bless you. And we almost get tired of hearing the same thing over and over and over. But the fact is, that is all true. And the fact is, we do suffer as, as God's children. And God has a purpose in it. Because remember, if you're suffering, that suffering, whatever it might be, has been run through a loving God that has allowed that trial to continue into your life. Mm -hmm. God, is, God is not absent from the process. God is highly involved in the process because, well, I'll just, let me get into the scriptures because I got to go back and we're just going to start at the first verse and I'm going to remind you because it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in here. And I, I don't know about you, but the more I hear something, the more it gets ingrained in me. Um, I, I, I'm going to go back through these verses. I'm not going to preach the sermons over again that I did, but I do want to point out what these verses are saying to you as a, another, another instance of trying to make this make sense to us because it really is very valuable because I, you know, I'm telling you, all of our life, we're going to, we're going to need what James has to say to us here because this is an issue of life. I don't care how old you are, young you are, where you are in life, you're married, you have children, whatever your, your condition might be. This is one of the constants in life because of God's purpose for it. And let's just look. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, James, the half-brother of Jesus, 
Uh, just to point out to you, James does not uh, brag about himself. You know, I'm James. I'm the half brother of Jesus, so you better listen to what I say. Or, uh, or hey, I'm high and lifted up because I'm the pastor of the Jerusalem Christian Church and I'm the, uh, the president of the council that decided that the gospel goes to the Gentiles and I'm a real big shot in the ministry. And so listen to what I say. No, James doesn't do that. James does. James just basically looks at you and me and he says, you know, I'm just like you. He said, I have no high exalted position. I have no high place with God. I'm just like you. We're all the same with God. I am a servant of God and I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm talking to you not as, as Pastor James or as Preacher James or as Half Brother James. I'm speaking to you as one servant to another. This is our life. James, bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's he writing to? The 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. You might wonder what that is. Just, there are 12 tribes of Israel. Can anybody name the 12 tribes of Israel? <laughs> Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Issachar, Naphtali, Zebulun, Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. I believe that's all of them. That's all of them. That's all the boys. Well, the 12 tribes of Israel came from Jacob's sons. You might remember Jacob in the Bible. And they were God's chosen people, the covenant with Abraham, you remember. And, and God blessed them. Well, by the time the New Testament comes, by the time Jesus is, is, is on the scene, the 12 tribes are scattered everywhere. I mean, they're all over the world, the, the known world at that time. And they remain scattered all over the entire world until... Uh, I think it was May 14th, I may be wrong on the May 14th, but 1948, when they were constituted back as a nation once again, and the nation of Israel, as you know it, and as you see it on the map, and you see it in the news every night, was established once again, where God's people were given their homeland back, and then Jewish people from all over the world began to fly into Israel. And now there are millions of Jews that live in Israel, but not a single one of them can truthfully and, and knowingly trace their ancestry back to exactly which tribe they're from. They were so scattered everywhere and so dispersed that all the records were lost and all of the orders were lost. And so James says, all right, I'm writing to all of you Jewish people who have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, who are scattered all over the world. I'm writing to the lost tribes. That's what we call them. And I'll just remind you that they're lost. They may be lost, but they're not lost to God. We don't know who they belong to, but God knows who they belong to, and God knows everyone by name, just like he knows you by name. Look at your neighbor and say, God knows you by name. You are not lost to God. But James says, all right, I'm writing to, to all of those that are, because that's all the, at this particular point, that's all there were, were Jewish, were Jew, Jewish people who had received Christ. The gospel hadn't gone to the Gentiles. The apostle Paul's ministry hadn't started yet. There's been no, it was only the Jewish people that had received anything from the Lord by this time. And James is saying, okay, I'm writing to all of you Christians. And then he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And the operative word there is what? When. Count it all joy when, not if. So trials are assured for us. James says you will go through trials, and he says that they are various. I like the old King James word for the word various there. It said uh, it's the word divers. Yeah. Divers. Divers and various mean the same thing, obviously. They mean multi-shaded. James says the kind of trials that you're going to go through into are going to be multi-shaded. It's like a rainbow. You know how one color fades into another color and fades into, it, and, and, and they're multiples. They're just, it's not just one color. It's just the color of the rainbow, many shaded, telling us that there are gonna be all kinds of trials that we go into. It's not just one trial that we face. And your trial might be different from my trial. These trials are custom made by God, designed by God for us because what might be a trial to me might not be a trial to you at all. And what might be a trial to you, a heavy load and a burden, I might not, it might not even bother me one bit. And so God individualizes these trials that we go through because they're intended for a purpose. 
And there are lots of them. And not only are they individualized, they're synchronized. I don't know if you've noticed this, but many times when you go through a trial, it just triggers another trial, which triggers another trial. As an example, you lose your job. You lose your job, you lose your money. You lose your money, you lose your house. You lose your house, you lose your wife. <laughs> you know, I mean, just one trial. So in other words, the trials that we faced are not only many shaded, not only individualized for us, but they're, but, but they are, uh, they're synchronized, and, they, and, and one triggers another and another and another, and, and they're all designed, and, God, and, and James says, you, look, count it all joy when you fall into these things. And I know the, the question is, how can I rejoice? How could I count it all joy? James says, I ought to be, when you fall into a trial, it ought to be a chance for you to rejoice to the Lord. And, and, and our question is, how can that happen? And so in verse 4, James says, uh, verse 3, James says, knowing, everybody say, by knowing something. All right, can you rejoice when you fall into a trial, when you lose your job? Can you rejoice because you lost your job? Because you feel, but by the way you feel? No, I mean, you feel terrible, right? You feel worried. You feel anxious. You, you, you're, you're about to lose everything you have. Where am I going to get another job? How can I replace this? Uh, there would be no possible way that we could rejoice or we could count it all joy if we did it by our feelings. So James doesn't say, feeling this. He says, count it all joy when you fall into these multi-shaded uh, trials of life because you know something. And what is it that you know? Well, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So I can begin to count it all joy when I fall into a trial because I know that this trial does something to me. What does it do to me? Well, according to verse 3, it produces patience in you. And what does patience do? Well, look at verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what is the intention of God in a test in life? That we would be made perfect and complete, and we would lack nothing. It means that I, can be I become strong. It means that I become capable. It means that my faith becomes real. Patience has a perfecting work in me. In other words, it ripens me. You know, your faith might be a little green right now. And it needs to be ripened. Well, what is going to ripen your faith? Well, according to James, when you get in the middle of one of these trials, you can know that when you're in the midst of this trial, that that trial is intended to do something to you. And what it's intended to do to you is put you through a process of ripening so that you can be mature and complete and lack nothing in, 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 in your spirit life. And so I can be happy about that because this trial is going to do me good and not bad because there are some things I need to know. I need to know before I stand before the Lord one day whether I'm real or not. You know, there are all kinds of people that say, hey, man, I'm going to heaven. Almost everybody, I guarantee you, just almost anybody you stop anywhere on the street and you say, man, are you going to heaven when you die? What will they say? They'll either say, yeah, I plan to, or I'm trying to, or I hope I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So there are a whole lot of people talking about going to heaven that aren't going to heaven, right? And there are a whole lot of people talking about going to heaven that are going to heaven. Well, which one are you? I mean, you would like to know, wouldn't you, before you stand before the Lord one day, whether you're real or not. You, you'd like to know whether you're just somebody that talks a good game or whether you have the goods, right? Well, according to James, that's what tests do to us in life. Tests prove out in our life whether we're real or not. And I don't know about you, but I want to know before I stand before God whether I'm real or not. So you say, how can you count it all joy when you start going through a test in life because you know something? What do you know? You know that this test right here is going to reveal something about you that you need to know in life, and it's going to take that green faith that you have and start ripening it so it starts becoming more mature and you become more capable and more able and you can relax and settle down and calm down and mellow out about all these issues of life. 
That's what James teaches us in these beginning verses about suffering as a child of God. You going to suffer? You sure are. Because God has designed some tests just for you, personalized for you, to show you some stuff about your life and to carry you through and to ripen some things in your life. If any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom about what? Wisdom about what you're going through. Wisdom about, Lord, what, what is this? How, how, can I, how can I endure this? Uh, Lord, give me some answers. Give me, you know, lead me and, 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 and help me understand what I'm going through. And, and Lord, I, 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 I don't know what, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't know how to act. I, what, what do I, where do I go? Is there something I need to do? Lord, what is it you have for me? I mean, wisdom from, from the Lord. And, the, and James says, when you ask him, he'll give it to you. Because it's God's nature to give. Yeah, yeah. Just like it's the nature of, of, of light to shine and the nature of heat to warm, it's the nature of God to give. And when you ask God, he's not going to chide you and belittle you and shame you and, 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 and about asking him for wisdom. He's just going to pour some wisdom out and you're going to have wisdom about this trial that you're going through because what is God's intention? That God's intention that this would do something in you that would bless your life, not hurt you, but, but bless you. So ask God, but let him ask in faith without doubting for he who doubts is like a way. It, James says, when you ask God for this wisdom, don't ask boldly. Yeah, yeah. Me, a, ask... Um, uh, well, I, start, I was starting to use a word that, was, that wasn't a word. But uh, is believingly a word? Is, Brian, is believingly a word? All right, believingly. Ask, ask, ask boldly. Ask believingly. You know? ask, ask God as if you are, are sure that he's going to give you an answer back. In other words, don't, don't, don't worry your prayers. You know what I mean? Some people did... Well, I don't even know if you understand what I, the term, but I, 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 people worry their prayer. They're like, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, how am I going to do it? Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's terrible. It's off. I'm lost. I can't find a way. I don't have any money. I, don't. I mean, just worry. That's their prayer. When they're saying it, they're worrying their prayer. Uh, it, it, don't worry your prayer. I mean, when you ask God for this wisdom, ask knowing that he's going to give it to you, believing, bold, strong. Ask him in faith without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. In other words, uh, you get the picture of a giant ocean somewhere and, some, and, and you're right in the middle of that ocean and just say that's an ocean of opportunity. And when you're in the middle of that ocean of opportunity, and you're asking God uh, for wisdom about what's going on, you have all of these varieties of things that you can do. And you hadn't tried all the things that you can try and do. And so when you ask, James says, don't ask God believing that God's going to give you an answer and then you can compare your answer to his answer and decide which one of them you think is best. Because if you already have a way and you determine, hey, man, I got, I got one more thing I hadn't tried. Well, you better try that one more thing before you start talking to God about wisdom because you're double-minded. In other words, you, you're, you're like, a, you're like a, the, the, a wave out in the water that the wind's just whipping around, whipping around from one direction to another. And you're unstable in all of your ways. Have you ever noticed people that are unstable in all of their ways? Yeah. Not just, I mean, they, it's not that just church. It's not, okay, uh, they don't come to church half the time, and half the time they do, and then they don't know why they came, and then they, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not just church life, it's every part of life. It's their finances, it's their child rearing, it's their home, it's their relationships, it's their job, it's their business, it's everything about life is unstable when you're double-minded, when you have no clear direction. And so James says, don't, 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 don't ask, don't, don't even waste your time asking God for wisdom if, you, if you're gonna, if you're gonna compare and, and, and go your way or his way. Or, I mean, don't, don't think God plays that silly kind of game. Uh, God's not that way. God doesn't play games with you like that. Then in verse nine, here comes James. In, in verse nine and 10, it's gonna sound like double talk. Look, listen, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. 
Now that sounds like double talk, <laughs> double talk a little bit. It's like, what in the world is that all about? Let the poor man exalt, be lifted, be encouraged, be strengthened in his, in his, in, 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 in his lowly, in, the fact that he's lowly and a rich person uh, needs to rejoice because they are humiliated. They're humbled. What in the world is that talking about? Well, it's talking about the two kind of trials that you'll face one of them in life, at least one of these. They're the twin trials of poverty and plenty. The trial of not having enough, which most of us fall into, and most of the readers of the book of James fell into this too. The trial of not having enough in life, and it is a real trial. When you don't have enough resources, when you don't have enough money, when you don't have enough prosperity, enough goods in your life, that is a real trial in life. And when you have everything you want, when you have as much money as you need, when you have all you want and maybe even more. I mean, I know most of us would say, hey, I'd like to take a shot at that trial, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but believe me, it really is a trial to have everything you want. If you don't believe it, just look at some of these multi-zillionaire uh, sports stars or, or movie stars or rock stars or whatever. Look at their lives. Look at what they do. Look at what happens to them. Look at the poor choices, the poor decisions. Look at the lunacy that's there. It's a, it, it, it is a real trial to have everything that you, that, that, that you want. So James says, all right, there's a trial of poverty where I don't have everything that I need. And he says, let the lowly brother, now this word lowly means crushed, it means life has crushed him. It means that he is, his ego and his pride and his value as a person has been crushed and he feels like a nobody. James says, let the, let the brother who's been crushed and feels like a, feel like a nobody be exalted by the fact that he's given his life to something that's far bigger than him. Let the lowly brother be exalted. Let him, I mean, how can, how can you rejoice in, in, in the midst of a trial when that trial has just crushed you? You, you, have, you have nothing and you're, you're left and you feel like nothing. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not. I mean, I don't really want you to raise your hand, but just, I mean, where, where something has so damaged you, something has so hit you, something has hurt you so bad, that you just feel like nothing. You feel like, you know, uh, yeah. as low as you can be. And when you go into some place, you feel like everybody's looking at you because they've never seen anybody as low as you. You know, I mean, it's just a state of mind that you can get into where you feel like you're not worthy anymore, yeah. that you're not valuable, that nobody wants you, or that, you know, people overlook you, or you're, you're not worthy of, of attention. I mean, you can feel this way. And so James says, when, you, when, when that kind of crushing hits you, here's what you need to think about. You need to think about the fact that you belong to something that's bigger than yourself, that you belong to something that, is, that, 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 that can lift you and strengthen you, and, and you belong to something that time and, and, and money and prestige and business can't take away, and that is who you are in Christ and whose you are in Christ. And the fact that even though you may be down, that there's, that, 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 that there's some, something rich and eternal and spiritual about you. Because I want to remind you guys, listen, this world is not our home. Right. This world is not going to last forever. And one of these days, it's going to be goodbye, world, goodbye, you know? And, and, and James says, look, when you get lowly and you get crushed, be exalted by the fact that you belong to God. You're accepted in the blood. You're washed by the blood of the Lamb. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ to the throne of God. And that one of these days, you're going to be taken to a place where you'll be exalted and live happily forever. You know, some of us look at people who have passed on as if they need to be pitied. 
I mean, really, you go, you go into some places where someone's passed away, everybody in there looks like, oh, the poor thing, I feel so sorry for him, oh, and they pity. Do, do you know that we are not in the land of the living, going to the land of the dying? We are actually in the land of the dying, going to the land of the living. And, and one of these days, we'll stand with the Lord. And so someone who is low and has been crushed and doesn't have all they need, and they're in this trial of poverty, can be exalted in the fact that they belong to God and they belong to the Lord and they have been lifted to a higher level because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And then on the flip side, he says, there's the trial of plenty. And in the trial of plenty, he says, you rich people, he, you know, even though the poor man is exalted in his position in Christ, uh, the rich person is, is humbled by their relationship with, 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 uh, with the poverty of Christ. I think James is saying the same thing Jesus said. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what Jesus meant by that? Blessed are those. The word blessed is markyrios, and I know some of you were here when we did it a long time ago, and you remember everything about it, but some of, some of, the, some of y'all weren't here. The word blessed is the word markyrios in Greek, and it means happy. So when Jesus is given the Beatitudes, and he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed, he's, he's saying happy. He's saying, you're happy when this. Happy are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means happy are those who realize their need for the Lord. Happy is the person who realizes that they're not too big for God and that what they need in their life is the Lord. And what, I think that's pretty much what he's saying here to, to those that have everything they need is, look, there's a, humi- there's a humility in life that's necessary for, for us to live a profitable life, an effective life. And even though you might have everything and you might be the greatest and people might look to you and, and all, all of that, he said, you, 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 you rich men, you, uh, you counted all joy that you've been identified with humility and brokenness and you found joy in being the son of God uh, because you've come to him. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the stock market's up or the stock market's down. It doesn't matter where you make a lot of money or you don't make a lot of money. Uh, because your real hunger is for righteousness and your real hunger is to be real with God and to have the Holy Spirit working in your life. And so James is saying, you know, look, uh, let me, he said, let me give you an example. And he goes on with this flower thing. Look at it. Because he says the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. And then he goes on to describe what he's talking about. Look at it. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. In other words, James is saying, look, just go out into the Judean hillside, uh, get you a flower, pick it up, look at its petals. It's beautiful, it's colorful, it's strong, it's virile. But you let, that, you let that flower just sit there in that hot sun and before long the petals will begin to fall off and, and the stalk will begin to wilt down and what once was a beautiful flower in all of its majesty and glory because of the heat of the, of the Judean sun, now you're looking at a bare stem that's withered. He said, that's how prosperity is in life. He said, prosperity is short-lived. It is temporary, and it can be gone as quickly as those petals and that stem will wilt because you can't depend on prosperity to carry you through life. He says, just when you begin to admire it, poof, it's gone, And, 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 and you're left with nothing. And so James says, look, those of you that are rich, those of you that have everything you need, you need to understand that there's a humility in life. There is a desire in life that will take you through times when your prosperity is gone in life. And so we all face one of those trials or the other, the trial of plenty or the trial of poverty. That, that goes in the blank. I know you're all anxious about that. And then this goes in the other. Okay, <laughs> there you go. All right. 
Look at verse 12. I'm obviously not going to get through all of this. Um, I'm fixed to quit. So let me just get these couple of verses for you. Blessed is the man who endures trials. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James is saying to us, you're going to go through these trials. And when you go through them, whether you, you're going through the trial of poverty or whether you're going through the trial of plenty, both of them are going to be a test to your life. But when you get through with the trial, God's going to bless you both on this earth and in things to come. So when you find yourself in a trial, realize that, that God's watching, you know, it's a, it's a test. It has to be a test. It, it, it's, it, and, and for it to be a test, it has to be a surprise. You know, if I came in today and I said, all right, I'm going to teach you these 12 verses of James, and then we're going to take a test. Now, that wouldn't be a test, really. That would be an examination. And I know you think I'm straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel here, but, but there is a difference. If I'm prepared for it, it just is an examination of how much I know about it. But if it pops on me, now it's a real test. It's a test to see whether I'm keeping up every day with what I should know and what I should experience and so forth. And so James says, these trials of life pop on you. They just, well, it's the word pyrosmos. I mentioned it a few weeks ago. It's the word, word, Greek word we get the word pirate from. So James says, these tests are like a pirate. Uh, I know we don't, you know, probably have never encountered a pirate. Uh, anybody in here ever encountered a pirate? Okay, but you've heard about them, right? I mean, all of a sudden, you got a ship out on a wide open ocean, and it seems like it's clear sailing and everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, it's just like they appear. It's like you turn, you look, and there's the skull and crossbones, you know, and the IE matey, and you know, and the, now you... <laughs> Now, 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 now you've been overtaken by this thing. Came out of the blue. You never saw it coming. You didn't expect it to be there. And boom, it was on you before you knew it. That's a trial. That's what James is talking about. So when you've, when you've been through, when you've been approved, when you've passed the test, when you've been blessed in life, you'll receive the crown of life. By the way, there are five crowns. Uh, let me just mention that to you because I know you probably say, well, what are they? There are five crowns mentioned in the Bible. When you get to heaven, you're going to get at least one crown, the crown of life. If you've trusted Christ, if you've come to the Lord, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to get the crown of life. And then, then there's the crown, of, the incorruptible crown, which is given to those who have kept their bodies under subjection and have not used their their bodies to do evil and so forth, that's gonna, they'll receive the incorruptible crown and then there'll be the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing is given to those who win people to Christ, who win people to faith in the Lord. The other is the crown of righteousness, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. If you live a righteous, holy life, that crown of righteousness is a crown that you'll receive. And then the crown of glory, that's one I'm gonna get. Because um, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a servant of the Lord. I've, my life has been given to the Lord. It's a pastor, soul winner's crown, uh, the crown of glory. So those are the five. James says, when you endure your test, you're going to get the crown of life. In other words, there's blessings for you right here and then blessings to come. And then it's like somebody interrupts James in the middle of his sermon and says to him, Hey, James, I'm not, I'm not going through trials. I'm being tempted. And James says, let no one say when he's tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. In other words, James says, what a horrible thought to say that God is tempting you. God doesn't tempt people. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to just kind of get a, a, a kind of a rounded little paraphrase here, basically James is saying, look, God does not tempt people because God cannot be tempted with the idea of even wanting to tempt somebody. Uh, God doesn't tempt people. And what he's setting up now is the difference between trials and temptations. 
And I'll get into it next week. Now, there is a, look, I'm going to tell you something. There's a difference between a trial and a temptation. And, and, and you got to know the difference. I mean, really, it's, it's a critical thing to know the difference between those things. And James says, look, there is such a thing as temptation. Temptation comes from the devil. Temptation is an invitation for you to sin. It's an invitation for you to fall. A temptation is set by the enemy to take advantage of your weakness and to, and, and, and to, and to ruin your life, to cause your life to fall. A trial is given by a loving God in order to make life better for you, to invite you to the next level. How many of you would like to go to the next level in life? You say, man, I'd like to go to the next level. All right, how do you get to the next level? God, God puts something into your life that starts ripening you and starts maturing you and you ask God what to do about it and he tells you what to do about it and you march through that with confidence because God's in it and it's been filtered through the heart of a loving God. It would have never come on you. It would have never been allowed to touch you had not God let it through the sifter so that it could do something great in your life. It's like, it's like stress testing metal. We don't stress test metal to prove it'll break. We stress test metal to prove it won't break. Yeah. And so God puts us through trials to prove in our life what we really are and to grow us up and to mature us and to prepare us for what God has in our life because God has a purpose for you. Look at your neighbor and say, you got a purpose, man. You got a purpose. You got a purpose. And James is going to tell us next week what that purpose is. Yeah. I'm telling you, he's, he's, uh, it's a rich book. It's a rich book. All right. Well, we've made our way now through 13 verses, and we've only had three weeks. All right, good. <laughs> wow. We're burning that road up, aren't we? Well, I hope it's uh, been profitable for you. I hope it will be and continue to be. But listen, um, there's, there are a lot of things that you'll, that'll, that'll matter to you in the book of James. It's real, it's very practical, every bit of it. And so I just encourage you, come on, hang in there with us and uh, the Lord will speak to us and bless us. You know, sometimes you just have to learn some things in order for your faith to be encouraged and strengthened and be real. Because, uh, you know, uh, pretty platitudes and funny stories and all that kind of stuff will help you be happy sometimes, but it won't carry you through those rough spots, those tough times in life. And I just believe the Lord's preparing us for, you know, where we are and, and, and where, what's coming on us. So, you know, come on, let's do that. Let's stand to your feet. Will you?